Hi everyone to the new tech talk meeting. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I think I'll share my screen. Uh, I'll just move this here and let's talk from here. So the first topic is from Maya. Uh, it's about pep and pip and version versus dot. Uh, Maya, you wanna ask your question? Yes. So we were uh, we would like to compare uh, both recommendation engineers from Python and uh, and dots. And uh, I would like uh, to hear what you think about this. How to how we can help to uh, to make the comparison? Because I heard a lot of different ideas. Like for example, um, that that has the advantage to could have the advantage to offer um, a more uh, educated experience to the user. For example, uh, or that we have uh, also a different kind of rec of recommendation stacks. So recommended stacks. So for example. Uh, we have settings like uh, security or latest uh, aspect, and but um, I would like to know exactly um, what we should compare and uh, how to proceed. So, do you have any ideas? Uh, so, what would be the output? Like, uh, if there will be created a report, what would be in that report? Um, I don't know exactly, so because for the moment uh, it hasn't been uh, evoked, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a report uh, would be great, but yes. Yeah, my, my concern is uh, that we come, first of all, we, we should compare something that is at similar stage, in a sense, if uh, we recommend a, a specific version is because that is the the correct version due to the resolver or is because we don't have that version and maybe the one that is independent so if you want to compare two things those two things needs to be in the similar state so if we make this comparison and we say use this version is not doesn't have to be because we don't have that version yet analyzed but has to be because uh, at the same level we can say that they are the same but thought to decide this in this case because um, there is that reason but we need to be on the same level to say that that is a thing that i think we should consider when we make that comparison and but then that, of course there is other layers on top of it the type I, of recommendation and etc cetera, etc cetera. that's basically a prerequisite right that um all the packages we are using in in a comparison are uh, analyzed by toth so that we basically have the same data uh, that, at hand. that is a, how do we get that yes like uh, yeah by the time we are going to ask that recommendation and either of the two it's going to be a different thing so how do we make sure that the, the output is something that we can say okay this is the reason because of this yeah um from my point of view it could be something like um uh pip and flock um is, is doing a good job um it, it's basically a story that we have had before is that a banana in the background of hashard <laughs> just saw that sorry uh Oh boy, I'm going to look at the other monitor now. Um, so um, the the story might be something like uh, pip and flock uh, will uh, lock your dependency graph based on the version strings uh, that we have available. Um, Thomas advice is doing basically the same thing because we are using recommendation type latest. Um, it should be very similar output from my point of view um, so that we can um, make the point um, we are not different that resembles back to data freshness on our side and stuff like that and um, if we're going to do thomas advice uh, for information type security there might or in the best case um, we filter out packages which are insecure and we can really show um, we are taking more in consideration than just version strings if we are resolving the, the dependency graph um, I think we have done uh, very similar things uh, in the past. Um, 
can't remember the repository, Frido, but we had an example repository um, with this kind of work, right? Um, and um, it feels like we should do that again, just to visualize what, what are we doing? Why is it interesting to use Thomas advice dash dash security or whatever the command line will be um, in opposite to uh, pip and uh, lock? Does that, does that make sense, that explanation? Uh, so what, what can be done? Uh, we can cherry pick a few uh, stacks that uh, we want to make part of this compersion. So for example, some AICOE uh, uh, notebooks or Lib libraries or applications that uh, people within AICOE use. Take pip file and, as you said, uh, create a log file using pipenv. Uh, that will produce JSON output uh, that stores locked versions of uh, libraries. And then uh, the report of this work can compare this log file to um, uh, Thanos advice security uh, recommendation type latest. Like uh, this is a uh, comparison and the output of that comparison could be that we are very similar to what Pipenv does when it comes to latest software stack and also measure like how much time does it take to exactly. because in some cases we can be faster for than Pipenv block. And that is uh, the first statement, basically. We are not different. Uh, we will be different because the underlying algorithm is different. Uh, the outcome should be we are not that different. Ah, exactly. Uh, we're doing things different, but you're going to get basically the same result. Not basically, but you get the same result if you're on latest, recommendation type latest. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, that, that's an interesting statement because it answers uh, the question, why should I use Thomas advice? Why should I do all that stuff in the Jupyter notebooks? Because A, we are not different. Um, we are just doing it a little bit different, but the result will be uh, the same. So you're not losing anything, but you're opening the opportunity to do, that is the next comparison from my point of view, recommendation type security. Uh, back to this latest, uh, also show that we show inform additional information and it is justification. So even if you're running latest software, we warn you about possible security vulnerability or uh, other aspects that pipeline needs that are plugged uh, during latest resolution provides to users. So basically linked to the documentation that is stating recommendation types. Like what, what a user gets when uh, lately when asking recommendations for latest software packages. So that's maybe speed, but uh, that uh, requires information on how the system is uh, loaded with requests. I think we will talk about it later. Uh, if speed uh, is okay, then additional guidance even on latest software packages and uh, that similarity. Like, sure, we are not that similar. Maybe we will be running older versions depending on uh, what are uh, uh, analyzed, what versions are analyzed, but also information with respect to uh the algorithm like the algorithm is not the same as uh pipenfix implementation so there will be definitely uh, differences one question i have is how much does uh thought just by the resolution process how much does it help reproducibility? And um, so PPM, you, you, you do a PPM log, and at this point in time, it will use whatever is available, right? But if you use Thomas Advice, you on the same stack, on the same repo, let's say, in theory, if someone else goes there and does runs it again, 
they will get the same resolution, more or less. Does that make sense? Or I'm I'm just wondering if this is a, a, a claim to do, or is just you know a side effect that might not Thank work. I think not at this point, right? Um, because if you're going to do the resolution in five weeks, it might be very different. So reproducibility is not the point um, of the dependency resolution. Um, right. It is at the point in time where we write back to the log file and keep that in version control where we get reproducibility. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Um, from my point of view, um, others, uh, please uh, chime in. From my point of view, just doing Thomas' advice is not helping with reproducibility. It's the magic of the log file. And uh, yes, that's log file. And we also store information about analysis ID. So we have that advisor ID on users. Uh, if users want to keep it, then we know uh, how the request looked like, how the environment looked like, and users can query it anytime uh, for that specific resolution. And maybe to add to this, if this would be reports uh, to customers or uh, to show value of, of the system, it might be also good to uh, make an introduction why PIP, why PIPEN, and why Thomas Advice. Like why we are starting uh, directly with Pippen here, because uh, people running Python applications, mostly customers will probably use Pip. So uh, maybe that's an alternative to Pip. And Pippen is somewhere in the middle. Like we took uh, the format of yeah. log file. Uh, exactly. That is uh, the key point here. Pip is point in time resolution, no log file, no nothing. Um, in the best case, you have a super bloated requirements TXT with pinning down all the versions, but that is not common practice, I guess, right? Um, pip env is doing a little bit better job because it's keeping the log file, so reproducibility, at least if you, if you version control your log file. And yeah, then into the um, argumentation about Thomas advice. Mm -hmm. And so this was to this workflow and the comparison pipen versus latest could be also applied to pipen versus security or whatever uh, you, you make. And in that case, it might be good to uh, state that yes, the request will most probably take longer than pipen like the speed uh, of that resolution will be slower. But the benefit is that the resolution is asynchronous. So you can ask anytime, as in case of previous resolutions, you can ask anytime the, the results of resolution, uh, but uh, it will really like recommend you uh, software packages that you should install and run. So if you want secure environments, you pay uh, with time, like the request can can take 20 minutes, for example, or at least 20 minutes, uh, but you get uh, software that the recommendation engine computed. And also the feature that we have, like if uh, you rely on a package that is uh, vulnerable, the security, advice will always fail. Uh, again. So if a user relies directly on a package that is vulnerable, so let's say Flask in version one has a vulnerability and you directly state it in the uh, pip file and ask for recommendations, uh, the resolver will block such uh, resolution. So it will for say the whole package or for that package version for the whole stack. It will say I cannot find a solution that would be security for your request or secure for your request. 
Is it just based on CVE or also on scorecard information? Is it is uh, it um, can we trace back that uh, decision making to a prescription? Uh, we can trace it, but right now we uh, use just CVE information. Scorecards are informative; they do not adjust the resolution as of now. And that security related uh, thing is not specific to a direct dependency, but also on transitive dependencies. So if you rely on Flask below one, and it uh, relies on Werkzeug, that in all versions that can uh, be considered have CVE, then uh, the whole resolution fails. captured that in the meeting notes and is uh, it's probably not there but you know as a feature request let's say you could could it make sense to add a, a feature to, to add an extra recommendation of hey this would be secure like if you relax that requirement and provide you know uh, an alternative um yeah, I know it's not easy. <laughs> uh, we don't do that right now because it's computational expensive. But we state uh, which dependencies have uh, have CVEs. So uh, in that case, users see okay, Flask in version one has a CVE. I need to update to new version or or do something about it. But that's a good uh, thing. Uh, because we can do these security related recommendations on container images. That's probably also worth to mention that we do not check CVEs only on uh, Python level, but on the whole runtime environment level. So if the containerized application uses RPMs or something that has a security vulnerability based on QI security scanners, then we can say even the container image is secure or is vulnerable. And uh, recommendations that would suggest to change container image are much easier to, to compute. Back to the customer, Maya. Does that help? Yes, it's much more clear now. Thanks. But I guess we should write this down somewhere public and like good information for newcomers, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. So, um, from my point of view, this should be um, something that we can recycle. It should be a blog article on developerator.com just to educate people how uh, what, what are the benefits of using Tamos. Right? Part of the document, uh, part of that article we have just written. Um, it it might be um, it might be a, a short video which is really explaining. Um, well, if I'm sitting on my laptop and just doing a pip install in a notebook. I might get trapped because um, security, uh, I just have installed security uh, vulnerabilities. If I'm sitting on my open data hub using Horos, which is reaching out to Tamos, which is doing a recommendation that's way more complex, it might take a little bit longer, but the notebook is way much uh, secure. So that might be uh, like a video that we can show up. So uh, think of it in, in multiple media formats. That's definitely all something that we're going to send out, yes. Sounds good. Any other thing uh, to this one? Don't? 
we can move to the other one, other topic. Uh, automate cascade leases for S2I images by Francesco. I think we already discussed this in the past, but um, yes. every time I release some Jupyter Lab, for example, or any minor package in S2I, then uh, we need to wait for all the other to be released before we get an update at the end. So, for example, at the moment, there's S2I custom, sorry, S2I minimal, then S2I lab, then S2I custom, and then we can take the actual image. And that is a manual process we are doing every time. And those are just some of the images, because we have many that depends on that images. So this was just a topic to discuss altogether what we can do um, to automate that, because otherwise, every time we need to go there and manually do that and of course there are already many many projects that depend on that um don't we have that from last week like automate parts on the release process is that is that very similar or is it one thing is just uh, on on the github operation and um, creation of new issues um on new cascading issues or shall we mix these two uh, things together in one activity or is the automation of images very different can't can't we control everything via github issues so it's a little different last time we spoke about was uh, about a python package getting updated and based on that uh, updating all the repositories uh here uh it's it's a cascading image image update. So it's for example, as you can see there, the S2I minimal, when it releases, we need to also update S2I custom with the version that got updated. Like we need to say that S2I minimal X version needs to be now the base so that it can build now. So it 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 has to be yeah. with uh, regard with inclusion with update issues, we need pull request as well. So that's how it will be done. Uh, we uh, so so we have another so we have one method like for the previous thing right for example if you have s2i minimal and you want to release s2i custom as well without having any change there is a there is a method to do that in the acci by using something called a sibling methodology where one is releasing you want to release another one but here it's more like a child parent case you need to use the version of that into another one uh, i don't know if uh, like it could definitely be updated with uh, with bots, uh, just it's just like uh, how much uh, information do we need? Is is the question here? Because uh, we are opening change logs with Kevishet, it's generating that, and then we are doing the releases. Uh, some or uh, some of the repository itself has the release notes. Uh, like for example, Elira, we put release notes by saying in this version, this is the Elira version and stuff like that. Uh, definitely can be done, but needs to be implemented. It's not there. Uh, so what about a new manager in Kebehead that would go to Quai, check uh, container images and their tags, and um, somehow determine based on, uh, because there is no semantic version as far as I remember on some of the images. Like as to I minimal or things like that, they have uh, like hashes or some weird uh, identifier, but we can check a release date or date when the the image was published, and compare it to the one that is present in container file, and in, in that case we would do something similar to update manager on Python level. Uh, that would be amazing if you would like to go in that part. I think there was one question long time ago, not long time, like a few months ago from Christoph as well, where he was asking about uh, REL-based images. So when REL releases, releases its image, uh, so REL, UBI and REL are our base image for everything, like on top of it. So the question was, it's it's in one of our tech talk where it was if, if we can monitor that one and see if there is an update there and release based on that, that would that would basically remove any of our like monitoring work uh, if you want to do that. But yeah, see, 
that's exactly the same thing. Yeah. So um, there is a component in, I think in Argo um, CD, which is doing exactly that, but it is very specific to Argo CD, where, where Argo CD keeps on updating the customized file or something based on the version number because of upstream release. Um, but that, that is very, very specific. I think what we really should do is monitor um, if there's a new release on, on the Cray repository. And based on that, we're going to, we're going to patch all the dependent um, Docker files to take that new released version, right? I wonder how we do that um, release management in that case because just releasing them might be not good enough. So if they are buildable, that, that's a cool thing. Um, if we release them, do we need some testing on that one? Or do we create release candidates? Mm, don't know. But it feels like there should be, mm -hmm. there should be an, an update of dependent container in, uh, uh, Docker files based on releases on an parent uh, Quay repository. Is that really an cabochet manager or is that more like an webhook receiver thingy? Or is that is that both in cabochet? We can start with uh, issues, uh, like the same way we click cabochet update, uh, then the webhook is uh, sent and cabochet is run. So if there is, will be a new implementation, a new manager that will uh, bump versions of uh, base container images that would work. And uh, later we can basically replicate the whole workflow uh, that is implemented in internal triggers. Uh, in this case, we will not do that for packages that are monitored, but um, based on container images. But even that uh, scenario using uh, issues, GitHub issues to trigger that update uh, can be helpful because the same way as we did last time, we can encode like uh, trigger new release of container images for these repositories and bots can, can do that. So for now we can be the trigger, uh, but later it can be automated. Yes. Sounds to me like we have a tiny webhook receiver, which is creating the issue later on, right? Maybe directly around Kebekhead. Yeah, all that. Yeah. Yeah. But the Kui API is, is pretty nice, so I think the implementation could be like straightforward for, for this. Thing is that we need to locate all the container files or Docker files in the in the repository and extract. Uh, nice. Isn't that grep and Z? So even these tools have a place in the cloud native era. Cool. Um, Mm, somebody get a little bit of capability, uh, sorry, capacity uh, left to do that uh, because it feels to me like a valuable capability um, that we could, um, that we should create, same as the automated release of the Python modules. Uh, but it feels like uh, we are out of time right here, right now, right? Is that maybe something we can give to Gregory? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, we can open it up like this. Seems like a, it's a task which we can give out for good voice test as well. Yes. Yes. Something. Uh, any other thoughts on this? Any questions? Anyone creating the issue? Or I will create the issue. Or... Yes. Okay. 
um, should this go on? just sanity checking, but is this going to the core repo or should I target yeah, this? Um, yeah, okay. Um, we can move it around anyways, or uh, I can move it around. I uh, don't know about the permissions again. Okay. Okay, moving to the next topic. Uh, uh, it's uh, about provide estimated advance time to use by Francisco. Oh, you know, say anything about this, Francisco? Uh, yes, that was an issue I think was created some time ago by Frido. And we, I think we have a solution now. Um, I don't remember where we put it in the discussion, but I don't know if you remember Frido. I think uh, we were so maybe, yeah. uh, can we get metrics on how queues are filled? Like how many messages are in Kafka queues, Kafka topics? How many unprocessed messages? Mm -hmm. Directly from Streamzy, or we can query that, Kevin? Yeah, so I, I have the current consumer offsets exposed um, in Investigator, and then I'm pretty sure Streamzy uh, gives the current offset like of the latest message. Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly what it's called in Strimsy though. So, Asha, those metrics are collected in Open it first. Uh, we would have to check. I'm not sure on that. Uh, they are collecting the Kafka metrics, uh, but we need to check. So there is this Kafka metric, uh, custom metrics which we can create from Kafka. So we need to check if it's there uh, or if we need to modify something there. Uh, but it's a YAML change. So if, if it's not there, we can add them. Okay. So uh, in the beginning, we yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, can you describe the, again the metric, Kevin? Uh, so I can write it here and check it later. Yeah, so it's the current latest offset um, for each um, message partition. Okay, thank you. Or I just put latest, not not current latest, that's kind of redundant. <laughs> yeah, I'll just check. I just wanted to know what this is. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Frido, sorry, you were saying So we could use uh, that offset and um, create endpoint for users, uh, which would tell users how the system is loaded. Right, and then we can integrate it into uh, client tools. And uh, the outcome would be something like, like we can start probably simple and uh, check number of queued messages and do some rough estimation on that. Is the, the um hypothesis in issue 727 that uh, where, where Francesco described a lot uh, the hypothesis is uh, based on the on the queue length uh, in Kafka we can estimate the um, advice time time to deliver an advice right mm -hmm. and the thing is that uh, the issue also describes uh, things on namespace level, like how many pods are running in the, in the namespace. And that could be something, you know, shaded away. So we don't collect also that information, but uh, focus purely on how queues are filled. Because we know that uh, if there are more requests in, uh, in the namespace, they will be processed after some time. And that some time can be configured uh, via um, config map. So we can act purely on, on queues. 
like an example, if uh, there are more than 100 messages for Kebehead and uh, advisor in total, we say that uh, the system will respond to request in about, I don't know, one hour. If there are 200 messages, then the system will respond roughly in three hours and things like that. And that computation can uh, can work solely on number of messages in, in queues. Yeah, I wonder um, if we would like to involve uh, HEMA and make this uh, data-driven development themed uh, topic, um, or uh, make it even an AI ops uh, themed uh, topic. Because what we are really trying to figure out is um, how do operational aspects like um, uh, queue length, like uh, cluster load, how does that influence the um, response time of an application? Maybe um, the conclusion is if you're going to put a little bit more CPU, response time of the system goes down by 50% which again might be acceptable uh, cost, investing that CPU, reducing uh, response time, that's a good investment. So maybe we could, should think about making this a larger AI ops topic. And I think that Francesco is our initial idea since June 29 somehow, or maybe even before that, right? Uh, Tamos advice and AI ops to, to mix them up a little bit. It. My random sort is done. Uh, any other thing? Any? to add to this Tom. okay uh we can move to the other one uh another one is the manage manage the data migration between stage and prod uh this is something for me uh we uh we have this issue where we are da ingesting data in stage and then we want to migrate that into production uh so right now what we do is we take the database from stage and directly put that into into the production but what happens is in this uh shift uh sometimes we lose data which is generated in the production for example that the build analysis the image analysis which are done in the production uh then they get overridden by this uh, migration uh so we just wanted to bring this up again to uh to the team so that we can think about what all things we can do in this regard Uh, so what are these data right now? So there's the SOI images which we get, uh, which we curate on the user API side and the management API side. That's that's the one table which gets audited by this because there is no data. That's not done in stage. It's just done in production specifically. So either we copy, either we, either we capture that and chop it up, up short, and once we uh, have completed the migration, we bring back those tables in. That's one of the solution. Uh, try to merge them together. That's that's one of the solution. And uh, so, yes, uh, one solution would be to sync uh, every time this data to the database. Yeah. Uh, we do a prod uh, release. And the other could be uh, that uh, specifically for container images, we could uh, like could AICOE CI send a request to container image analysis to stage? Is it possible, or it's something yeah. not possible? It, it it could it is possible to send the request to multiple places. Uh, so that's what we can do. So in that case, we can point to stage environment. 
uh, that's like another possibility and uh, make uh, so uh, imaging there is s2i you know uh, some some container images released like computer vision uh, container image is released mm -hmm. uh, we create a tag version one and the container image is pushed to Quay. But the container image analysis will not happen in broad, but in stage. In that case, uh, we will keep data solely in stage. And as we populate stage data to broad, we will then say in release notes, there is a new container image available. Uh, and the reason behind that is also that uh, related prescriptions uh, will be released as the container image is like the data that are related to container images will be released together with a new dot release is that clear yeah uh, would that make sense that means one one drawback that means that container image that is released today as version one will be available to customers or people in two weeks as yeah. we populate the data the container image will be still available on Quai, but people who want to consume that container image will not get recommendations right. and actually it somehow feels like an inversion of our initial strategy to generate all the stuff and backport it to stage, right? Yeah, I was about wondering the same. Why, why is data produced in stage and then the DB move to production? It shouldn't be. I mean, if it, it's a staging environment, well, I think we are trying to save on on cost here, right? Because we are doing the heavy computation on stage, which is in PSI cluster, which is in Red Hat internal system, rather than doing it on production, which is Amazon money, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right, Hashar? Yes. Okay. So these are like uh, container image analysis are the data that we uh, want to have in production. And, and that's something cu that we... current versions of that in production, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the the strategy to copy it from stage and have a timeout or an, an, an black uh, period uh, of two weeks doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the other way is to uh, yeah, that's that's the downside because we override these data with new account, uh, new database going on. We would also override information about advisors and advisor results if people use authenticated requests. That's another source of data that are specific to environment like where the deployment sits. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, the first um, the first statement is is uh, a killer uh, criterion, right? Um, if if we are serious about um, security, if we have all the module automated module rebuilding in place, automated image rebuilding in place, keeping data not up to date within two week uh, blackout period feels like the opposite of delivering security sensitive data on time. That can happen any, anyway, because we release prescriptions uh, with uh, advisor. So if there's a security vulnerability today, we mark it in the prescriptions repository, but that information will be populated into uh, populated to customers on next release. That's possibly something also worth to optimize. So if we spot new data and we see that the, these data are something 
that should be reached to to people, then we can do new releases of prescriptions even outside of release cycle. And we can automate that. Put it on for the 2nd of December tech talk. But anyway, anyway, we did not fix the, the original issue and that is on writing data in prod environment. I would like to uh, revisit the the strategic uh, goal of really calculating all the stuff on production and um, dumping back into stage. Um, can, can 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 we get an estimate for how much work is done on PSI for for uh, all the new? Uh, yeah, full stop. Can we estimate how much work is done on PSI? Is it something like still these two weeks of full power computing using all the resources of the namespaces, or is it is it not that much? At least one namespace keeps running every day. Like that's fully consumed. So and that is something like sixteen CPU. Yeah, yeah, sixteen CPU and uh, one memory. Holy moly. It can be better and more cheaper to create dumps solely for solver data, like solved uh, like tables that are related to these calculations, and then restore only that change. It's worth a spike if we can configure PG dump to dump only specific tables and restore it. In environments. Do we need to have a look at something like a TOS knowledge dump, like incremental TOS knowledge dumps, so that we dump parts of the database and corresponding JSON files and stuff like that? Um, we're going to take that bundle, put it on a on a Zeph drive, and Toth will automatically pick it up and refresh its brain. Is that is that something that we should investigate, maybe? And briefly checking the first stack overflow link, uh, there is parameter table. And in that case, um, generates uh, inserts specific to that table. So that would be like easy. Uh, we would just take that dump specific to tables that we are interested in and uh, apply it to production. But I don't have uh, experience with that. It's worth to, to check. Yes, I, I, maybe I, I wrote down the incremental toss knowledge dumps um, idea. Please, please have a look at the show notes. Um, I don't know what needs to go in there, but obviously image analysis of S2I images, um, um, parts of the database. So that's that's just an idea because it feels like we could isolate uh, blocks of information and just transfer them. Because that is what's happening if we analyze new stuff anyways. We just need to figure out a way how to transport them. Is that, is that right? Yeah, basically it's right. The uh, assumption here is, I thought, that uh, we will not run solvers in production environment. 
because that would diverge from the original data. So solvers in production environment will need to be turned off. That's good because uh, it will save resources. And uh, also we will need to start in one like root, one uh, parent version of the database that will be uh, then maintain maintained. Yes, but that assumes that we run all the solvers on stage all the time, right? Yes, and, and transfer that information, okay. Uh, why can't we run them on, on prod? Because uh, we would diverge from uh, the database snapshot, which we want to update. Yes, like, okay. Uh, we right. would... And that's good because if people ask for recommendations, we will be like two weeks behind in the worst case, but we will guide uh, better on security, uh, right? Because uh, like that's that's the timing issue. Mm. Like we release a uh, thing, release uh, new prescriptions for the resolution after two weeks, if that's necessary and uh, together with data that corresponds to the security information. Yeah. But that's, that's something also to, to optimize. Thanks for the thoughts. I'll try to convert these into a different uh, issues so that you can discuss more there and write up uh, idea just so that we can start formulating our method or the way we would like to go so that we can keep mod modifying or getting better at that. Uh, any other comments on this? A general comment. Um, let's let's figure out if we really save something, right? Uh, if we invent new methods and software and blah 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 um, over the next um, five weeks, just just to save fifty dollars on Amazon, that that's not worth it, right? In that case, I would say let's fall back to render everything or, or calculate everything on prod, um, and 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 just ignore stage. But I have the feeling that we are not talking about $50. It, it's a little bit more. If there's a namespace on stage, which is uh, 16 uh, cores, and that's running full time, it feels like a little bit more than $50. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. Still worth uh, checking. I mean, don't delete that sentence. I think it's still worth knowing at least how much you know even if for curiosity yes That's good. So let's move on to the next topic. So I think we are already over the time. So should we just move this topic to the next time or would you like to continue? It's no comment or yes. <laughs> ah, that's, that's bad for making decisions. Um... So, uh, Fr Francesco, we talk about the retrigger solvers and then stuff? Just a question, so if you want, but uh, otherwise we can move it to the next. It was just to know if um, when we release a new thought solver, we have to retrigger all solvers for the packages. If we introduce a new data to be added, for example, the import name, the one that Jürgen was working on, how do we know that uh, we collected for all, all the packages? Uh, that change is addition. So uh, if you start running new solvers with the feature they again introduced, uh, the information will be automatically inserted into database. 
and for older packages that we've already analyzed, uh, that information comes with new runtime environments. So when we plug, for example, Fedora 35, yeah. then uh, this information will be calculated. So the, like in any case, the process is, we don't have a process to do that. We wait for the new solver in case. If you already analyze all the packages until now, for example, and we add a new thing tomorrow, then we need to wait for new Fedora release or new whatever in six months or so. It depends on change. So this change was like really incremental yeah. in feature. So uh, yes, uh, it can just uh, compute. We don't need to recompute uh, all the rerun, all the solvers uh, that we've already run. That would be expensive. And uh, we would need to do that if there would be some critical bug in, in solver. But okay. other than that, if there are changes in solver, they should be considered as incremental. So we can provide that functionality to users over time. OK, then that answer my question. Thanks, Pigo. How are these incremental changes uh, generated by solvers? Because there will be a new package release and solver will kick in anyways. That's what we are saying. New runtime environment. So for old uh, packages, like packages that we've already analyzed, plugging in new runtime environment will automatically ah. uh, make sure that. And that can create an issue because we have uh, one restriction in the database. And that is um, integrity check that should be more weak. So we are checking that uh, previous solver results do not um, uh, are not different from solver results we are trying to sync when it comes to uh, metadata, for example. And that should be recon. Mm -hmm. And uh, back to the runtime environment, we are running the new solver with additional information just for the new runtime environment or for all of them? Uh, say it again, the, the question. Yes, um, so we say that the um, new resolver version that is creating incremental information that is just run if we create a new runtime environment. Is it run for just the new runtime environment or for all existing runtime environments? Uh, the change that Tegan introduced is not specific to runtime environment, it's specific to okay. analyze package. So if we analyze it uh, in other runtime environment, we'd get that information that generalizes across all the runtime environment. Okay, but we could also kick new solvers, right? Uh, regenerate all the data if we want to. Yes, but yes. that's okay. like weeks of computation. Yeah, depends on the size of the cluster, but yes. Okay, and uh, what was uh, your second comment? Um, the the that we need to weaken a dependency or a constraint uh, we have a constraint in database that if there are around two solvers and they compute dependency information and metadata that these data are not different otherwise we refuse to sync uh, data to to the database now in this case these data are different. So uh, we will refuse to sync new solver results. And I think we encounter this issue another time. Ashford, I think you, you showed me that, uh, you know, there were these two different values that of, of solver that we tried to sync, but I cannot recall what was like the problem for that. Like what is, that is that the triple equal to is that the one? Yes. 
the where we had triple equal twos and some ones we had five equal twos. That's not those. Um, it was like the it was the mismatch of aggregation. So like initially, uh, initially there was the package was taken, and if the pip file had uh, defined uh, defined packages like direct uh, packages with values, it was taking the values as uh, so we put the equal to equal to x x y z right. So it was taking instead of that, taking two equal twos, it was taking equal signs. It was taking five equal signs. Is that the one? I, I don't remember, but uh, I think that was created an issue. I'll try to uh, look up on that and provide it here. Uh, are we continuing with the other topics or should we just move it to the next time? And I think the one of Dominic, if I'm not mistaken, is the one that uh, Kevin is just solving with the request. I had also the same issue. We cannot release uh, at the moment because it does not recognize the difference in commits. So the topic can be considered done, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we, we are looking at it. Uh, right, Ken, uh, any comments on this? Yeah, I, I think it is that, that thing that I messaged you, Harsha, but. Uh, yeah. Because I tested it on a test repo and it's working fine now. Oh, so yeah. would you like to talk about your sorry, someone was saying something. Uh, yeah, uh, if there is an issue tracking the uh, Kibishet issue, <laughs> there is one which we created yesterday. Uh, okay, uh, it's here. Yeah. Please uh, ju just paste it in the uh, doc. I will. I will also follow the thread to be updated. It's mentioned in the PR as well. Okay, thank you. Kevin, would you like to talk about your topic? Thanks, Roman. Yeah, so this is just something that I thought about for uh, optimization for Kebishet. So instead of having um, investigator scheduling like one-off Kebishet uh, runs, um, it would be possible to create a service out of Kebishet, which directly consumes Kafka messages. Um, this would be like a, a huge rework and might even like, you might even want to make it its own repository if we attempt to do it. Um, I just didn't know what other people thought about it. Can you can you say again what you want to do? Uh, you want to to have Kebishet as a as a as a service running in the background all the time, consuming Kafka messages. So we basically have uh, one interface that is bridging webhooks into Kafka, so that Kebishet acts on them, right? And the yeah, other one basically. is internal triggers turned from webhooks into Kafka messages. Yeah. Um, and the idea here is that a lot of times Kebishet runs just to realize that it doesn't have anything to do. Um, so they're super short lived, like just spinning up a uh, container and then dying immediately. Because um, not every webhook is a is an actual trigger and the repository is not always in a state that it needs uh, updated. Don't be dramatic. It's not dying. It's it's terminating normally it's terminating. without being any purpose to yeah. the past. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Sounds reasonable. Um, what about having an iteration on uh, user experience of Kebishet? I think we have had that uh, before somehow, and then really go into it. Uh, go go into that. Um, new architecture because it feels to me like uh, there will be a few things to be done here so if if we could um, slowly spec out what needs to be done that would be great um, I, there's no immediate benefit to the to the github application right it's more like an internal change we're going to do here yeah mm -hmm. 
yeah, it uh, feels like um, Kevishet could could use some some cleanup. Um, I don't know if we still have Zai's uh, way of involving stuff. Um, it, it it might be a good idea, but uh, let's have an iteration on the on the user facing side. So really have a look at the user experience of Kevishet, and if we can give that a little bit of love and while doing so, spec out what needs to be done for uh, Care Bechette as a Kafka consumer. I, I like that. I like Kafka. It's a cool thing. So let's let's do that later. Awesome. Uh, any other comments? Anyone? Uh, if not, thanks. Thank you for staying a few more minutes extra for the call. And thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.